So today, I'm going back to one of the series that I had launched about three years ago on Edward Said's Orientalism, and I hope to now start continuing where we had left our conversation and then build on that and see where we go from here. So here we go with Edward Said's Orientalism. So if you take the time to follow from the beginning until this point, whatever is previously available, you would realize that I had left the conversation at a certain point where Said is discussing three aspects of Orientalism and its mechanistic and organismic way of looking at the Ori. He discusses Cromer at length and his view of the Orient. He also quotes Kipling. That was in the lecture that precedes this one. And that was covered until page 46. Today I'll be reading from page 46 to 48. He is kind of building up on what he has previously discussed and then giving us a real life example of how someone contemporary to the time when the book was coming out, and that is Henry Kissinger, how he sees the world in a binary structure. And remember, Kissinger was probably the most powerful Secretary of State United States has had, and he also is seen as an expert on the superpower politics, a pretty dominant figure in American policy making, especially American foreign policy. So let's read. I'll be reading from middle of page 46 to the top of page 48. Most of the conversation in this part is about one particular essay that Kissinger wrote in probably the mid-70s at the time that the book came out. And then we can talk about it. A contemporary illustration or two should clarify this observation perfectly. It is natural for men in power to survey from time to time the world with which they must deal. Balfour did it frequently. Our contemporary Henry Kessinger does it also, rarely with more express frankness than in his essay, Domestic Structure and Foreign Policy. The drama he depicts is a real one, in which the United States must manage its behavior in the world under the pressures of domestic forces on the one hand and of foreign realities on the other. Kissinger's discourse must, for that reason alone, establish a polarity between the United States and the world. In addition, of course, he speaks consciously as an authoritative voice for the major Western power whose recent history and present reality have placed it before a world that does not easily accept its power and dominance. Kissinger feels that the United States can deal less problematically with the industrial developed West than it can with the developing world. Again, a contemporary actuality of relations between the United States and the so-called Third World, which includes China, Indochina, the Near East, Africa, and Latin America, is manifestly a thorny set of problems which even Kissinger cannot hide. Kissinger's method in the essay proceeds according to what linguists call binary opposition. That is, he shows that there are two styles in foreign policy, the prophetic and the political, two types of techniques, two periods, and so forth. When at the end of the historical part of his argument he is brought face to face with the contemporary world, he divides it accordingly into two halves, the developed and the developing countries. The first half, which is the West, is deeply committed to the notion that the real world is external to the observer, that knowledge consists of recording and classifying data. 
the more accurately, the better. Kissinger's proof for this is the Newtonian revolution, which has not taken place in the developing world. Cultures which escaped the early impact of Newtonian thinking have retained the essentially pre-Newtonian view that the real world is almost completely internal to the observer. Consequently, he adds, empirical reality has a much different significance for many of the new countries than for the West because in a certain sense they never went through the process of discovering it. Unlike Cromer, Kissinger does not need to quote Sir Alfred Lyell on the Oriental's ability, inability to be accurate. The point he makes is sufficiently unarguable to require no special validation. We had our Newtonian revolution. They didn't. As thinkers, we are better off than they are. Good. The lines are drawn in much the same way finally as Balfour and Cromer drew them, yet 60 or more years have intervened between Kissinger and the British imperialists. Numerous wars and revolutions have proved conclusively that the pre-Newtonian prophetic style which Kissinger associates both with inaccurate developing countries and with Europe before the Congress of Vienna is not entirely without its success. Again, unlike Balfour and Cromer, Kissinger therefore feels obliged to respect this pre-Newtonian perspective since it offers great flexibility with respect to the contemporary revolutionary turmoil. Thus the duty of men in the post-Newtonian real world is to construct an international order before a crisis imposes it as a necessity. In other words, we must still find a way by which the developing world can be contained. Is this not similar to Cromer's vision of a harmoniously working machine designed ultimately to benefit some central authority which opposes the developing world? Kissinger may not have known on what fund of pedigreed knowledge he was drawing when he cut the world up into pre-Newtonian and post-Newtonian conceptions of reality. But his distinction is identical with the orthodox one made by Orientalists. Separate Orientals from Westerners. And like Orientalism's distinction, Kissinger is not value-free, despite the apparent neutrality of his tone. Thus such words as prophetic, accuracy, internal, empirical reality, and order are scattered throughout his description and they characterize either attractive, familiar, desirable virtues or menacing, peculiar, disorderly defects. Both the traditional Orientalists as well as, as we shall see, and Kissinger conceive of the difference between cultures first as creating a battlefront that separates them and second as inviting the West to control, contain and otherwise govern through superior knowledge and accommodating power, the other, with what effect and at what considerable expense such militant divisions have been maintained, no one at present needs to be reminded. So Saeed in these passages is highlighting one important aspect of Orientalist discourse or our Orientalist way of looking at the world. Remember in his discussion of Cromer, he had talked about the center, the civilized center, radiating its knowledge to the world and the Orientalist experts there collecting raw materials, collecting knowledges, but their work is dependent on the center and similarly center obviously needs the periphery and these experts to stabilize itself. And he's using a contemporary example by suggesting that this isn't something that is old news. That powerful writers and politicians still use these tropes. And the reason he's using Kissinger's famous essay is to illustrate that point. That Kissinger sees the world, first of all, he divides the world into what he considers 
the West, the civilized parts of the world, and the non-West. Then he philosophically further divides it, not just as West is more developed and the rest of the world is not more developed, but rather that essentially those who live in the developed world have a post-Newtonian view of the world. So part of my understanding of the Newtonian worldview is that a transformation occurs in the West, which is that people start looking at the world scientifically and not in terms of spirituality and religion. And the world exists of matter, which is detached from us. We can observe it. We can think about it. It is not preordained. And the distinction that Kissinger is making is he's assigning all these scientific values and reason and rationality to the West. And the East, so-called, is still caught in a pre-Newtonian age, pre-Newtonian reason, so hence they cannot detach the world from their interiority. That's the binary structure that he's playing with. But it's not just a, an analysis of the poem. Policy of the most powerful nation on the planet is built on that. Now, obviously, what Saeed is pointing out is that Kissinger might not be aware of it, but he fits perfectly in the tradition of the Orientalist discourse that was employed before him, that Balfour and Cromer had employed in justifying the Western colonial imperatives, Western colonial power. And Kissinger is doing it by employing the same immutable categories assigned to these two constituencies, so-called the West and the East. Now, if you observe the world clearly, you know that there are larger segments of the Western world who still have religious view of the world here in the United States. And then there are large segments of the so-called East, China, Russia, Soviet Union, which it was at that time, who rely on science, whose understanding of the world is not dictated by their interiority or by this idea that God has placed everything in this world, even the most religious of groups have access to science. But he must create this binary structure because the argument is that this rational world, this, these democracies, must then control the irrational part of the world and hence the imperative for U.S. policy to intervene. So this is what I gather from this reading. But if we were to further think about it in contemporary terms. Right now, United States' response to what's happening in Gaza is built around this binary understanding of Israel and Palestinians. So Israel, by its very nature in American imagination, is a democracy and hence a natural ally to United States. The Palestinians, on the other hand, are offered to us as violent, as people who have no organization. If they fight against Israel, they are terroristic, right? That is the binary structure, and it makes it so much easier to sell whatever Israel is doing, to the point that their prime minister, right, who is a right-wing prime minister, but still can garner support from American liberals, who would otherwise be highly opposed to anyone who has right-wing politics. And this prime minister who has overseen the murder of 40,000 people, starvation of 2.3 million people, murder of more than 16,000 children still being killed, can visit United States as the leader of a civilized nation and address the US Congress. What makes that possible is this view that since Israel is part of the Western Alliance, it's a so-called democracy, it cannot do anything wrong, even when literally it is destroying a people. Now, that is what Orientalism teaches us, right, is that these views, we just read about Kissinger's views about the East and the West, 
they are not just innocuous views. Just as in the case of Balfour and Cromer, the policies were developed around them, people were assumed to be managed. The same is happening right now. U.S. foreign policy still is about how to manage the world, how to see anything that might be competitive as a threat and control it and offer it as menacing. Now I would say that it's even worse because the Orientalist way of looking at the world has permeated so deeply into American culture and it's perpetuated every day by the news media and even by the politicians. Politicians who even claim to be progressive and liberal. So that's what I gather from this brief reading of Orientalism and from Said's discussion of the binary structure that Henry Kissinger creates in his explanation of how U.S. foreign policy is etched in this scientific realm, rational realm, and U.S. needs to manage these other people who are irrational, who live with pre-Newtonian mindset and hence are ossified in that ideology. And the role of foreign policy is for the United States to manage that. So that's where I leave you with this brief foray back into Orientalism. I will continue speaking about this and reading the book with you. But please do keep in mind, there are so many other things in the world that I need to do. And one of them is, of course, making a living. So I can only do this as and when time permits and as and when I have enough time to read, think about the book, and then produce something that is worthwhile, that is useful to you. Now, after you read this part of the book, let me know. I mean, what do you think? I gave you my ideas, but obviously you must have come up with some of your own ideas and understandings. Please do share those in the comments and I'll try to respond to them. That's all I have so far. If you haven't subscribed to the channel and if you feel like this material is useful to you, please do subscribe. And as always, take care, be kind and generous, and I'll see you next time. Until then, peace and love.